Shalom, friends. Robert Gottslig here from the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry. The last time we got together, we concluded the ninth chapter in the book of Zechariah. And there we saw in verse 10 that it was depicting uh, Messiah's second coming, in which he would destroy uh, his enemies, destroy those nations that are coming against his people. Uh, we also saw that uh, he would rescue the remnant of his people, Israel, and save them physically and spiritually. And we saw in verse 12 of chapter 9 that a double blessing is coming to nation Israel in the millennial kingdom. Uh, instead of receiving double for all, all their sins, there's coming a time when they will receive a double blessing. Uh, we also saw in verse 16 that they're precious in God's eyes, and he calls them uh, the stones of a crown. And, uh, and, and, and that the Jewish people, you know, are precious in God's eyes. That's why in Genesis 12, it says, I'll bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. And so we looked at those things last week. Well, this week, when we look at chapter 10, we're going to see that God is speaking to Israel as a shepherd. And uh, we're going to look at that in, in uh, parts of chapter 10 today. And of course, when we make our way to chapter 11, we're going to see the rejection of the shepherd, of the good shepherd. Um, but that shepherd, uh, we also saw in verse 16 of chapter 9 here. I'm just going to reread uh, part of that here uh, before we get into chapter 10. It says in that 16th verse, And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock. So he will be the shepherd, they, they will be his sheep, and he's going to save them that day. And then it goes on to talk about the stones of a crown and that they're precious in God's sight here. And so that then brings us to chapter 10. And so like always, if you have your Bibles handy, uh, turn with me to Zechariah chapter 10, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 6 today. Verse 1, God says, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So it starts off here with saying to Israel to be asking the Lord uh, for this latter rain, which would be in the months of March and April, which would be essential for crops uh, in, in that area. And so God's saying, ask of me for this rain. And he says, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. And so God will provide that rain should his people ask him. Because look at verse 2, it says, but this is what they were doing. It says, for the idols have spoken vanity and the diviners have, have seen a lie. So the people were asking their idols for these things. You know, they were, they were, they were trusting in these idols, which are, are just make-believe gods that really don't exist, that couldn't offer uh, any answer to anyone's prayers or hope or anything. But Israel was turned aside from the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob unto idols, and they were asking these idols for the very things that only God could provide. And it says they were asking the diviners, but the diviners spoke lies. It says, and they told false dreams, and they comforted in vain. It says, therefore they went their way as a flock, they were troubled because there was no shepherd. And the people indeed were troubled. You know, the shepherd here, speaking of the kings and the priests and the prophets, they were supposed to lead Israel. They were supposed to lead the Jewish people to the only one and true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not unto these idols. You know, I think of Deuteronomy chapter 18, and I'm just going to read that here for a moment here, speaking of, uh, you know, diviners and uh, enchanters and witches and... Uh, uh, very occult, uh, what we would know as occultic here practices. Here it says in verse 10 of the 18th chapter in Deuteronomy, it says, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. And so here's a clear, clear uh, instructions for Israel and really for all of us here today. Nothing's changed. Seeking occultic practices, whether it's tarot card readers, people are into uh, fortune tellers, uh, you name it. The list is long and mighty. And people consult these uh, for uh, knowing the future, for offering them hope and help. But only God can offer that. Only the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob can offer you help. And he could only offer Israel help, not the idols, not the fortune tellers, not the, uh, uh, the diviners, uh, because all of these get their power not from God, not from God. Many times they get their power from the devil, and the devil hates you and hates myself uh, and hates the Jewish people. 
And so God, it's an abomination to the God to do those things. But here he asks Israel to seek him and he will bring the rains upon their land. And look at verse three here. My anger was kindled against the shepherds. That is, that is Israel's leaders, the, uh, the kings, the priests, the prophets. They were supposed to lead Israel uh, and point them to the one and only true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not to the idols. As I mentioned, the idols could not offer uh, any, any, any kind of hope for the people here. And uh, it says, and God says, And I punished the goats for the Lord of hosts, has visited his flock, the house of Judah, hath made them uh, as his goodly horse in the battle. And we're going to see here where God's going to, is going to empower Judah to defend herself uh, before his second coming here. But look at verse 4 here. It says, because out of him, speaking of out of Judah, right? Uh, speaking of the Messiah here. Of course, you go to Revelation chapter 5, right? It, it, it talks about the uh, Jesus. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? Um, and, uh, and here we see here in verse 4 here, these are depictions of the Messiah that's coming out of Judah, that will come out of Judah, and it's depicting him as the cornerstone. It's depicting him as the nail. Out of him, uh, out of Judah will come the battle bow. Out of him will come every oppressor altogether here. And we're going to look at that here in a minute. But for now, I'd like to just take a look here at the cornerstone and go to Psalm 118 here. And in verse 22 here, it talks about the cornerstone. It talks about the stone in verse 22, which the builders rejected is become the headstone of the corner. And so here it's depicting that the people, nation Israel, would reject their Messiah, reject the stone, the rock, the cornerstone. Remember Daniel chapter 2 talking about that stone cut without hands. That's speaking of the Messiah when he comes at his second coming. And he's going to destroy all the world kingdoms. And, uh, and here it says that the people would reject him. That's what we're going to see when we get to Zechariah chapter 11. We're going to see where the, the people, where nation Israel will reject their shepherd, the good shepherd. And so here we see Messiah as the cornerstone here. And then we also see him as the nail here. And I'm going to look at Isaiah chapter 22, verse 23 here, speaking of the Messiah. And it says in verse 23, I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for, the, for a glorious throne to his father's house. And as I mentioned, Messiah, he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years on the throne of his father, David. And, and he will be that nail, you know, a nail. Think of a tent when you put your tent up, that tent peg, that nail, it, it keeps things secure. That's exactly what the Messiah is going to do in the millennial kingdom. He's going to keep things secure. He's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And so he's this nail. And out of him, also there again, out of Judah will uh, come the battle bow. Well, I'd like to read Isaiah, portions of Isaiah uh, 63 here. And it says here, um, Verse 2, it says, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, speaking of the Messiah, and thy garments like him that treadeth in a wine fat? So the question is being asked, why is, why is the Messiah's garments all red and spattered up? Verse 3, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And so here we see that Messiah is treading in this wine press alone as he's defeating Israel's enemies, those nations. Joel chapter 3, and we looked at Zechariah chapter 12 when we come to that, and chapter 14, where the Lord's going to go fight against those nations. And so we see here that he's going to, um, he's going to, out of him will come this battle bow. And then finally in verse 4, out of him, out of Judah, will come every oppressor together, where basically Jesus is going to be the leader over every rider. And I think of Revelation 19. Uh, look, if you will, at verse 11. And I know I'm going kind of fast, but you can look these up after and rewatch this. But it says in verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. See, this is exactly talking about like what we read in Isaiah 63. He's got a vesture that's dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes this sharp two-edged sword, and with it it should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Wow, Messiah is going to come back, 
and, uh, to, to, to uh, defeat his enemies. And so we see this here in verse 4, these depictions of the Messiah here. We see him uh, as the cornerstone. We see him as the nail. We see him as the battle bone out of Judah. Uh, we see him that, that he will be this, this, this leader over every rider, as we read in Revelation 19, as we all, the saints, come back with him at his second coming. Amazing. It says here then in verse 5, And they shall be as a mighty as mighty men which tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. And they shall fight because the Lord is with them. And the riders on horses shall be uh, confounded. And uh, and so you see here um, that, that, that Messiah, when just before he sets up his millennial kingdom, and he comes back to destroy Israel's enemies, that he's going to empower Judah to defend herself. Look at verse 6 here. It says, And I will strengthen the house of Judah. Okay, that's speaking of the two uh, southern tribes. And I will save the house of Joseph, speaking of the ten northern tribes. And I will bring them again to the place, uh, to place them, for I have mercy upon them. And they shall be as though I had not cast them off. And I am the Lord their God, and I will hear them. And so here we see where, where you know, God is rescuing the remnant of his people Israel. He's empowering Judah to defend herself, uh, that remnant. Uh, what a wonderful time that's going to be that the Jewish people are no longer going to be a curse in the world, but they're going to receive this double blessing. Um, and, and, and we are going to see where Messiah is going to rule upon the throne of his father, David, for a thousand years. But we also see here in that verse that God's going to remember their sin no more. And friends, that's exactly what happens to you and I when we put our faith and trust in Messiah Jesus. He casts our sin as far as they are, as from the east to the west. The same thing is going to happen to nation Israel as a whole one day, uh, where, where God indeed will cast away all their sin forever. And he will be their God and they will be his people. So these are some, some exciting verses again in Zechariah chapter 10. And that's all the time we have for today. We'll, we'll conclude chapter 10 the next time we get together. And so if you like this video on my Facebook page or YouTube channel, just make sure you give it a like and share it with all your friends. And so until next time, Shalom and God bless.